we have been receiving critical data back and there's a lot more to come. For example, uh, many of us know Arturo Campos was a NASA engineer who developed a plan to bring the crippled Apollo 13 crew home safely uh, for a mission that something terribly went wrong. It's looked in the annals of NASA as one of the most successful missions because they saved the crew. Well, on the spacecraft now, Orion, is Commander Munikin Campos, namesake, uh, his namesake, aboard Orion. And this is uh, a somewhat what we would call a mannequin, a Munikin. He's outfitted with sensors to provide data on what crew members might experience in flight. And that data will continue Compost's legacy of enabling human exploration in deep space. Of course, we've said from the beginning, since this is a test flight, the biggest test after the launch is the reentry, because we want to know that that heat shield works at about 5,000 degrees. Um, almost uh, half as hot as the sun. Coming in at 32 Mach, it's going to hit the atmosphere at about 200,000, uh, well, at, at the ultimate uh, entry point, and then it's gonna dip down about 200,000 feet into the upper atmosphere uh, at that 25,000 miles an hour. And then it's going to pull up and it's going to bleed off some of that speed to about Mach 22, 17,000 miles an hour. We've already learned a lot. And this team's resilience is just unbelievable. And it's incredible how smoothly the mission's gone. But it is a test. And that's what we do. We stress it and we test. Uh, and when Orion comes home on the 11th down in a couple of weeks, uh, we look forward uh, to learning what all those sensors will have told us in order to be able to put four human beings on the top of Artemis II. And then we're going to the moon into lunar orbit in preparation for Artemis III, where we will have four go into a lunar polar elliptical orbit that will then have two of the astronauts in the lander go down to the surface. That will be the first woman and the next man. So let me turn it over to Vanessa Weish uh, Vanessa is our great uh, director out there at the Johnson Space Center. Hey, Vanessa, take it away. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Administrator Nelson. And I believe we have a video that we're going to play, so we're going to play that video first. Five, four stage engines start. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. Wow, so go Orion. You know, this mission 
is just the uh, success of many women and men from all across NASA. Uh, and then for Orion itself, Lockheed Martin and the flight control team. Um, it's just a wonderful um, opportunity that I have. I've gone over to the control center and had an opportunity to talk with many of the members of the flight control team, people in the support rooms, back rooms, and thank them for their work. But now is not a chance for me to publicly say thank you uh, to each of them for all of the hard work that they've put in into this mission. Uh, I also want to thank Howard Hugh as the program manager. I want to thank Rick Lebrode as the flight lead flight director. And I want to thank Mike Serafin as the mission manager. Uh, the mission is just going completely flawless. Uh, of course, we're learning. There's things that we um, have to um, you know, figure out about the systems themselves. But you know, Orion is just performing so very well. Um, you know, this is a chance for us to talk about the fact that with Orion today uh, being a spacecraft that is in lunar um, orbit, uh, we also have a spacecraft, the International Space Station, that's in LEO. So right now, our teams are controlling two spacecraft. And it's just amazing, the accomplishments that we've had, and many more to come. But with the Artemis program, as the administrator said, uh, right here at NASA's Johnson Space Center, we're just super proud of the Orion. We're also working on the Gateway, which will be a platform uh, in the lunar vicinity. We're building new suits. We're building rovers. We're working with the Marshall Space Flight Center on the lander all of that so that we can continue to explore with our astronauts going into space. This mission is just a great success. Uh, it's the beginning. It will allow us to do Artemis II, where we will put our astronauts on board. Uh, the tests that are going on today, um, you're going to hear the mission management team, because uh, Orion is performing so well, they are adding new uh, test objectives to the mission. So that's a great thing that lets you know that um, right now we're learning about this vehicle and preparing for going forward into the future. Uh, I did also just want to share uh, that, um, you know, right now we have spent um, this past weekend celebrating Thanksgiving, uh, and our flight control teams uh, did get an opportunity to celebrate Thanksgiving. And um, we just want to say again, Thank you to all of the people that are making this possible. Uh, it takes all, uh, many, many people all around the world to make this happen. And uh, with that, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. You're doing a great job, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. And for additional opening remarks, we'll turn it over to Artemis Mission Manager, Mike Serafin. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you for those kind words, um, Administrator Nelson and Vanessa. Um, welcome to uh, Flight Day 20 or Flight Day 13 of our 26-day marathon. Um, you know, as, as Vanessa mentioned, um, we are looking at adding additional objectives, um, and the halfway point in this mission uh, allows us and affords us an opportunity to step back and, um, and look at what our margins are and where we could be a little smarter to buy down risk and, and understand the spacecraft's performance for uh, crewed flight on the very next mission. So this halfway point teaches us to number our days so that we can get a heart of wisdom. And adding seven new objectives above the baseline that we agreed on uh, to further characterize the thermal environment but also the propulsion system uh, allows us to, uh, to again get smarter for crewed flight. Uh, in terms of mission status, uh, we are continuing to proceed along the, the nominal mission. And uh, we passed the halfway point in terms of uh, distance from Earth. We passed the halfway point in terms of time in the mission plan. And in terms of mission objectives, uh, if, again, if you look back at uh, priority one, which is demonstrate the vehicle at lunar reentry conditions, we bought down half of that on launch day by the rocket delivering us the Space Launch System rocket delivering us uh, to the point of translunar injection and setting up the initial conditions, uh, we will not realize the second half of Priority 1 until uh, entry, descent, and landing day, as Administrator Nelson uh, described in, in his opening comments. In terms of Priorities 2 and 4, uh, we are 25 percent complete, so we've got 31 of the 124 baseline objectives complete. Uh, we have 37.5% uh, of those objectives in progress, or 46 of the 124, and then 375 
uh, percent uh, yet to be started. A lot of those are uh, essentially tied to uh, entry, descent, landing in the post splashdown time frame. So adding the uh, seven, uh, what we're calling real-time objectives, uh, adds uh, above and beyond that, that 124 objective content in terms of um, uh, priorities two and four. And then priority three, retrieving the spacecraft, we will again achieve that on uh, entry and splashdown and recovery day. Uh, we are starting our initial preparations for uh, deployment of the recovery forces um, out at Naval Base San Diego. Our uh, exploration ground systems led uh, recovery operations team in the U.S. Navy um, have uh, begun their preparations for what they call just-in-time training. And uh, they are going to deploy tomorrow for that training and then uh, come back to shore and then set up for, uh, for recovery. Uh, in terms of the mission management team, uh, we did meet, uh, since the last time I was here to talk to you, we did meet on Tuesday, November the 22nd. It was a non-decisional meeting, 45 minutes, and we just largely status the progress of the mission. Uh, we also met on Wednesday, November the 23rd. Again, that was largely a non-decisional meeting. Uh, we did go through um, the uh, imagery findings to date, and we did discuss those, and there were no imagery findings of consequence uh, through our integrated imagery team. And then uh, the mission management team was off uh, Thursday, November the 24th through Sunday uh, the 27th, largely because the mission is proceeding so well. Uh, and none of the uh, anomalies uh, or funnies that are out there are of consequence. We did meet today for two hours. Uh, it was a decisional meeting. Uh, we did close one of our anomaly resolution teams uh, associated with the star trackers and the uh, random access memory uh, built-in test hardware that we're seeing a number of funnies on. And uh, we essentially concluded that the hardware is performing uh, as expected. And, um, and this is really just a byproduct of the flight environment. And then um, we did approve uh, two flight rule waivers associated with uh, uh, setting up for the, um, the uh, additional flight test objectives, and those will enable us to, uh, to set up the initial conditions for that. So uh, with that, I'll, um, I'll pass it back to you, Leah. Thanks, Mike, and I will pass it over to Rick Labrode, Artemis One Flight Director. All right, thank you very much. I uh, can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be here to uh, give you a status on, on how well things are going. It, it's always a lot easier when things are going so well. Um, I think I want to start with a, uh, I have a graphic that shows, that you've seen before, it's the, it's the uh, mission trajectory. So if you could put that up, please. I'll kinda, it's pretty straightforward. We're halfway in the mission, so you figure we're halfway through the DRO. So I don't know if we got that. Okay. There we go. And if you look at uh, number 11, which is essentially, like I said, halfway into the DRO, that's where Orion's, uh, that's where Orion's located right now. Uh, the imagery was crazy. You, you saw that, that the imagery that, and that, that um, opening um, video clip, and uh, I can tell you, I was, I was in the control center at the console for, for a majority of those images, the ones that include the Earth and the Moon, and it's 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 really hard to articulate what the feeling is. It's just it's just amazing to to be here and seeing that. So uh, it's certainly a pleasure. So um, so I'll just give you kind of a status on where we are. Um, Mike talked a little bit about you know we're just clicking off our detailed flight test objectives. Everything's going extremely well. Uh, going so well that um, we're working with Howard and his team, the engineering team and the European partners, to add more uh, more test objectives. If you recall, if you supported the uh, the pre-mission briefing, I talked about you know the, the simple question was why are we flying the flight or what do we want to try and accomplish, and you know up to the to this mission everything was was. Um, just test data. So uh, a lot of our, our models that the engineering team uses for all their analysis, they're, they're using just data, you know, um, figures and test test information. Well, this the effort that we're doing now to get this this real uh, real time performance data from the vehicle and the environment is is that valuable data that's going to be put into the test, the update the models uh, to allow us to to. Um, know exactly how this vehicle is going to operate. And it will relieve us of a lot of our constraints. Uh, a lot of these objectives are going to be, uh, you know, the thermal environment. Try to expand the thermal environment. Um, you know, right now we're constrained to, we can, we can get out of the tail to sun attitude for upwards of three hours, but when we come back, 
we have to wait 10 hours before we can do another uh, excursion. So uh, we're hoping to get more information, get smarter on how the vehicle uh, thermally responds to give us uh, more flexibility. And that'll, that'll be directly uh, beneficial to the future Artemis missions when we're flying, uh, flying the crew. Um, Let's see, up to this, let's see, for the mission to complete the trajectory, we had uh, planned for 19 translational burns. Uh, up to this point, we've done nine, and it's, it's, been, it's been, we've used every one of um, Orion's prop propulsion systems. We've done three larger burns, greater than 100 uh, feet per second, using the orbital maneuvering system, the Ohms uh, engine. We've done three using the Plus X, or you'll hear them called as auxiliary thrusters. Um, and those those three were on the order of less than nine feet per second, and then we did three also using the reaction reaction control system RCS system, and those were all less than one foot per second. And we did uh, two of those burns where we actually maneuvered the, into attitude, uh, the specific attitude, and, and thrust in a specific direction. And the last one we did was uh, it was a very small burn, but uh, we did it multi-axis where you don't even have to maneuver to the to the attitude. So it was a gr great test of Orion uh, propulsion capabilities. Um, we were going to do a burn today. Uh, uh, we call these orbit maintenance burns, um, but we opt it was a very small burn. We opted not to do it, and a part of the reason also is because uh, when we do our next uh, orbit maintenance number three, which is in a couple days, we want to. Uh, this is one of those t test objectives that we're uh, that we're adding, and that's we want to burn the the plus X. Um, the auxiliary thrusters for 100 seconds. It's a lot of that's going to be testing uh, the the thrusters and themselves. Uh, they're they're rated for much longer than that, but we haven't used it yet uh, for those kind of durations. So we're going to do that. But we're also going to test. Um, I think we want to test some of the pluming on on the on the solar arrays during that time frame as well. So um, um, let's see. The upcoming. Uh, just give you a little highlight on what's coming up. Um, we'll depart the, uh, the distant retrograde orbit on Thursday, start heading back towards the moon. And then uh, when we, we have the return powered flyby, that'll be on flight day 20. Um, and that, uh, that again, we'll, when, we fly by, um, when we fly by the moon, we'll be 80, 80 miles off the surface. So we should expect to get some more spectacular uh, imagery of, uh, of the moon as we fly by. So I think yeah, that's uh, that's all I have to uh, to report at this point. So I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. All good things, and I will turn it over to Howard Hugh, Orion Program Manager. Thanks, Leah. Uh, let's see. I'll start with uh, thanking Minister Nelson and Center Director Weish for recognizing the team. Uh, certainly, it's very tough. Uh, working during the holiday and missing some time with the family and friends, but the team performed tremendously. I want to thank the flight control team, our engineering team, and our European partners, our Lockheed contractors, who work tirelessly to make these burns happen and monitor spacecraft as we get into this distant ret retrograde orbit. It was really an important uh, phase of our mission. It got us into a point where uh, I feel really good uh, getting to this this part of the mission uh, and a really opportunity to, I would say, catch our breath a little bit and uh, do a, a, a very important orbit around the moon and being able to do, de do some tests and demonstration of additional capabilities uh, for the spacecraft. Of course, you know, you've heard from Mike and uh, Rick that uh, we're, the spacecraft is operating uh, just tremendously well uh, so far, and, and we're really uh, happy with its performance overall across all the subsystem areas. And we've been able to uh, accomplish other uh, what we call detailed flight test objectives as well as we've gone along the mission, and we're going to try to accomplish some more in this uh, DRO orbit. And I, I think it's, it's, it's a testament to not only the spacecraft uh, capabilities and the performance so far of the spacecraft, but also the team. The team has been uh, doing a great job of not only monitoring our spacecraft and uh, looking at some of the funnies and making sure uh, it's performing as expected, but also looking at uh, opportunities to uh, further along test this uh, very uh, important mission and the spacecraft that we have to further uh, future missions and buy down future risks as we put crew on board. And I think that's a, that's a great uh, opportunity that we have today uh, in the DRO. 
I, I would say that uh, also, uh, I, I mentioned last time we were here, our performance across the board continues to be uh, outstanding relative to the power we're generating, continue to generate 20% more power than we really need. Uh, we still have tremendous amount of uh, propul propulsive capability or reserves in the prop, prop, prop tanks, excuse me. And uh, we certainly are, are looking at uh, other performance uh, measurements across the board, across the spacecraft, and those are all uh, going very well. So really happy where we are halfway through the mission, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, completing this part of the phase and uh, getting uh, our spacecraft home safely. So thank you, Leo. Thank you, Howard, and thank you again to all of our briefers who have joined today. We will now move into the question and answer portion of our session. So a reminder, if you're online, uh, please use the star one to raise your hand if you have a question to ask, and star two if your question has been answered. We will start here in the room. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mark Corot with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, I know I'm leaning forward a little bit, but I'm wondering if, if you've received enough significant data from this mission so far that you can maybe update your planning dates for Artemis 2 and 3, even, you know, an estimate or a, <laughs> a season or a month or a year or do you want me to start with that one, Howard, and you can? Yeah, and I'll follow it. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Mark. Uh, we are starting to look at um, the Artemis II dates. Uh, we know that we need to uh, refly some of the components um, from the Artemis I vehicle on the Artemis II vehicle, and uh, we're looking at the uh, at the detailed schedules there. It's it's a little bit um, early to say exactly what those are, but we did talk today in the in the mission management team about how the uh, avionics boxes are performing that we plan to refly and uh, and they are performing very well. Um, I don't know, Howard, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I would say that uh, to add on what Mike's saying, you know, I think it's really good that, uh, you know, we're looking at and getting all this data, uh, especially with the avionics boxes we need for Artemis, one, uh, Artemis 2 from Artemis 1. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be making sure those get off the vehicle when we uh, splash down safely and get the Artemis 1 crew module back. That will go into our Artemis 2 uh, spacecraft. Uh, for Artemis 2, we will also, uh, we're also right now in the flow. So we're working very hard to, to uh, go as fast as we can. And uh, we're learning a lot uh, from our obvious Artemis 1 flow, and we'll incorporate those lessons learned into our Artemis 2. We still have a lot of testing ahead uh, with Artemis 2 spacecraft, both the crew module and the service module that we need to accomplish. And uh, I think after this mission, as the boxes come back uh, from Artemis 1 and put on board Artemis 2, you know, at the agency level, we'll be reviewing all our schedules across the board and, and, and stitching those together. So that, that's where we stand today. Yeah, and, and Mark, um, the only other point that I would add is, you know, if you, if you come back to our priority three objective, which is uh, retrieve the spacecraft um, for uh, programmatic cost savings and avionics reuse, that, that is baked into that retrieve the spacecraft objective. Um, we had to work our way through a number of challenges uh, just to get to launch. And we had, uh, you know, variable mission duration and we couldn't anchor the schedule activities until we, we got through uh, the hydrogen uh, leak challenges that we had and the hurricane and, and a whole host of other things. And then uh, uh, the uh, launch date anchored which, which class of mission we were flying and, and we are on a short class mission, a 26 day mission. So we're taking mm -hmm. that into consideration now and we're starting to work that into our schedules. Thank you. And just before we go to additional questions, a couple of things I wanted to note. Administrator Nelson and Center Director Vanessa Weich won't be able to join us for the question and answer portion. And then just a reminder to our media to please state your name and affiliation and to whom your question is addressed. So with that, back to the room. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Two questions. First of all, for, for Mike, I think you talked about priority one objectives. And I'm just curious how much of the overall risk at this point you've retired You've gone through launch, obviously. MMOD is looking pretty good, or was as of the last briefing. The three different classes of thrusters on Orion seem to be performing pretty well. So, like, you know, landing is kind of the main objective left. So, is that like 50% of the risk, 75, 25? Just trying to get a sense of where your primary concerns are in terms of sort of overall risk retired. And, Howard, there was a blog post about a loss of comms several days ago with Orion. I'm just wondering what the resolution of, of that issue was and if that's something to be concerned about going forward. 
Okay, I'll start, Howard, and you, you want to follow up on the, on the uh, blog post? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, thank you for the question, Eric. Um, in terms of risk that's retired, we did um, talk pre-flight about the, the Pareto chart, which identifies our top risk drivers. Certainly, uh, micrometeoroid and orbital debris, uh, which is our, our top risk driver, is in play until we get out of the space environment. Uh, but being halfway through the mission uh, puts us roughly halfway through that uh, risk because it, it is a function or a byproduct of how long we're in the spaceflight environment. We had other risks associated with uh, first time flight of the rocket and the um, uh, overall uh, system performance of the rocket, um, the integrated avionics and software risk and, and RS-25 engine. Um, all of those have been retired. We have a demonstrated um, uh, rocket. In terms of the spacecraft, uh, some of those have been bought down, but some of them are not going to be uh, retired from a, from a mission standpoint until we get to landing day, uh, specifically the uh, parachute uh, and parachute deploy uh, system and then the heat shield. Uh, so that, uh, again, comes back to our priority one objective. Uh, you know, the rest of the risk drivers uh, that, that come to mind, um, you know, we, we certainly have done a uh, much better job of characterizing the overall system performance, and uh, and I think you know we are uh, buying down some of that. So that's that's kind of a, you know, if you're looking at our top ten risk drivers, you know, some of them have been retired, some of them are still in play, and some of them won't be realized um, uh, for good or bad until we get to uh, uh, entry, descent, and splashdown day. And I'll turn it over to Howard for the blog question. Yeah, Eric, um, I, I'm not sure specifically which comm outage you're referring to, but I'm going to ask Rick to talk about we've had some ground comm issues not on board, but uh, I'll let Rick go first. Yeah, so if it's the one I believe you're thinking about, um, you know, the, in order to make sure we get comm, enable comm from the vehicle, uh, Flight Controller and Mission Control Inco has to send the command to get the onboard comm system configured, and then uh, the ground controller uh, also, flight control position and mission control coordinates with the with the deep space network uh, engineers, gives them what the configuration of the vehicle is going to be. Then they then they actually load the parameters to configure the, the their network to support it. Um, that, so it's it's compl uh, complex, um, and we've changed things uh, since the beginning of the mission is to uh, to give us more capability, to open the bandwidth. So uh, we've uh, added two more modes. Uh, they're based on data rates, and then we go uncoded, which then um, doubles our bandwidth. So we're not using a, a coding scheme to improve our uh, signal-to-noise ratio, um, which allows us to actually bring down more data. Do that streaming. When we started streaming the video, uh, it was because we were able to open the bandwidth, uh, which allows us to do file transfers, bring the data off the off the vehicle, and also do the streaming video. Well, it, it is, was simply a misconfiguration at the Deep Space Network, uh, where uh, they were set up for a data rate that that the vehicle was not set up for, and it uh, just you know going through the the troubleshooting process finally finally figured that out, and then uh, th then we recovered. Once we got the right data rate, we, we uh, recovered the return link. Yeah, and Eric, just to add a little clarity on this one, as is, is I understand it, Rick, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, we need the spacecraft data rate, the deep space network ground site data rate, and the MCC data rate all to be in the same configuration. And, and we got out of configuration and with those um, just, just due to um, kind of some ground-to-ground -ground coordination. Did, did exactly, I get that right? exactly right. Okay. Okay. Next question is on the phone with Marsha Dunn. Hi, good evening. Um, a couple of questions, um, probably for Mike or Howard. How many avionics boxes are you going to be taking from Artemis 1 from this Orion to put on the next one? And what else is being shared that will be removed from the spacecraft for the next mission, no matter how small or uh, in insignificant it might seem? And then secondly, for Splashdown Day, how many people and craft do you expect to be part of the recovery effort? How many people and how many ships, planes, helicopters? I'm just looking for a big picture. Thanks. Yeah, maybe, Mike, I'll take the first one, if you can take the second one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marsha, thanks for the question. Um, right now, uh, we're looking at eight avionics boxes uh, across the board from Artemis 1 uh, to bring from the Artemis 1 spacecraft and Artemis 2. Um, 
Let's see, your, I think your other question, and maybe you could repeat the second half of your question if I don't get it exactly right, um, has to do with, can you repeat that one more time? You wanted uh, uh, additional information on the, on what else is, I think, what else we, we're bringing forward that's not avionics box, is that correct? That's correct. What other pieces are you going to be pulling out for Artemis II? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we are, uh, I think Mr. Nelson mentioned uh, Munich and Campos. Um, Munich and Campos sits on a uh, uh, Orion seat, and so we will be using that seat for Artemis II as well. Uh, that's a non-avionics uh, system that we would be utilizing on Artemis II, but uh, nothing else uh, from the spacecraft on Artemis I that we would be reusing besides those items I mentioned. And Marcia, uh, thank you for the question on the recovery operation. Um, and our uh, our recovery uh, operations lead, Melissa Jones, is, is not on this call. So um, you might want to confirm some of this uh, with her at a later time. But um, the, the uh, ship, uh, we have a well deck ship um, that is uh, provided via partnership with the uh, U.S. Navy out of Naval Base San Diego. Uh, we will put uh, about 85 NASA um, and uh, and uh, uh, industry partner personnel on the ship um, to uh, support that operation, and that is above and beyond the um, the ship's standard complement, uh, which uh, is a couple of hundred sailors. Uh, we, we will have uh, deployed from the recovery ship itself at least four small boats, what they call small boats. Um, two of those will be um, what they call rigid hull inflatable boats, and then two of those will be um, kind of a smaller uh, rafts. And then we'll have uh, two helicopters deployed from the flight deck, um, one to, uh, to support uh, some of the... Um, imagery observations associated with the parachute deploy and splashdown, and another one to support uh, locating the objects uh, that are uh, jettisoned from the, um, uh, from the spacecraft as it descends, things like the forward bay cover and some of the uh, parachutes um, as part of the parachute deployment sequence. And then we'll have at least one aircraft uh, at a higher altitude cap capturing imagery. So that's kind of a, a broad picture of it. Uh, we can get you more details um, at a later time. Okay, next up we have David Curley with Discovery Channel. And David, uh, if you're speaking. Sorry about that, I was having a little trouble. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. I guess this is for Howard. Uh, quick question, um, what kind of data are you getting from inside the capsule in the environment the astronauts would be in specifically, you know, are the temperatures right? What, what, what are you seeing so far inside? Yeah, um, right now, uh, good question. Right now, we're, we are getting temperature readings. Uh, we're getting, obviously, uh, um, pressure readings as well inside the cabin. And uh, everything's nominal as we expected. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, what was loaded or what was in the atmosphere when we closed the hatch is what we've got. And our leakage rates are really low. I think it's like 0.03 uh, per day or something like that, PSI per day. So we're really uh, 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 understanding not only just what's inside the cabin, but uh, uh, obviously a lot of measurements we have inside the cabin relative to Munich and Campos. The radiation sensors are all being recorded, so we won't uh, get that data from the cabin until we get back on the ground. Next question is from Bill Harwood. Hi, uh, thanks. I got two quick ones. Uh, one for Mike and one for Howard, I think. Um, is, is the Star Trekker issue you've mentioned a couple of times, is that the most significant problem you've had with Orion? Or is there anything else that's, that's provide worry, or maybe not worry, but required a similar level of troubleshooting? And I wasn't clear how you resolved that, or if you just decided that's just the way they operate and we understand how it works now and that makes it okay, or if there's something you had to do about that. Um, and can Howard, can you tell us what those eight boxes are? I know it's probably buried in the press kit somewhere, but I can't remember what the avionics boxes are that you're going to take off Artemis One and put on Artemis Two. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, hey, hey, Mike, let me, uh, maybe I'll, I'll address both questions. Uh, if you don't mind, you can add to it. I think with the Star Tracker, it's certainly the highest visibility. You know, we when we first uh, we had a couple issues where we took, I think, a a uh, radiation hit on the space uh, on the um, 
Star Tracker itself. And we also uh, had this issue with the, a bit flip uh, re relative RAM where uh, inside the um, box itself, it has error detection correction automatically. And I think I mentioned the last press conference, you know, it, it does, when you have a, a radiation hit, it, uh, it may flip, flip a bit in the memory, it auto-corrects itself, and it just tells you. And it's a very, very good system that uh, is on a lot of uh, deep space kind of a hardware, avionics hardware. And in this case, when it first uh, tripped, uh, we were getting indications that uh, the, you know Star Tracker wasn't performing, and I think through our analysis and of course very detailed look at all the data that we got at that time, we made some decisions obviously to press forward. But it turned out that the Star Tracker was working just beautifully. Uh, it was outputting navigation data as expected. This bit trip we, we found out uh, through our future uh, or our last few days, several days of ha uh, hard work by the team, is that this is very anomalous behavior. Uh, many of the star trackers in deep space and even e geosynchronous uh, satellites and low Earth orbit satellites have uh, data that shows that they take these kinds of RAM um, upsets and, uh, and so they get auto-corrected and they log it. And so today when we went to the MMT, we walked through all the data, we showed a lot of uh, detail in terms of not only you know, from our own program, but from other programs that uh, the Europeans have flown, from other programs that uh, we know about um, from our, our, our sister uh, programs to learn what they've seen and the data corroborates uh, what, we've, what we uh, uh, hypothesized to be. And I think that turned out really well in terms of uh, the Star Tracker performance um, and uh, understanding what happened with the Star Tracker. So I'll pause there, see if Mike wants to add anything to that uh, yeah. before I ask, add, answer the next question. Yeah, Bill, thank you for the question. Um, you know, Howard uh, said it well. The team did a very thorough analysis of the uh, Star Tracker uh, random access memory um, bits that were being set. And uh, this is a case where leveraging our uh, industrial base and um, other missions out there, whether they're NASA missions or um, other missions that, that use uh, this common uh, set of uh, avionics or very similar design to it is, is helping us and we tap that expertise. In terms of other issues that are out there, uh, you know, we do have one active um, anomaly resolution team associated with the uh, power conditioning and distribution unit um, of, on something called the latching current limiter. Um, it is uh, apparently being uncommanded open, so for some reason these, these um, latching current limiters on uh, umbilical one, uniquely on umbilical one, uh, there have been a, a number of occurrences uh, that, are, that are being, um, uh, nobody's on the ground commanding these things open. So we're trying to characterize that and understand what the hardware is telling us, and that active uh, our anomaly resolution team is, is working in the background. Um, it is not a high-level concern because we have um, uh, appropriate levels of redundancy. There's uh, four solar array wings, two of these per uh, channel, per power channel, and uh, we're recovering from these. Uh, we just don't quite understand what the hardware is telling us, and, and we're expecting an outbrief uh, from that anomaly resolution team in the next couple of days. Uh, the the uh, other things that are out there, uh, you know, we've talked previously about the uh, coolant loop one flow rate being erratic. We believe that there's gas uh, in the um, in the fluid, and uh, we're periodically seeing the, uh, the 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 flow rate drop, and then it comes back up as is the uh, the gas bubble moves its way through the uh, the coolant loop. Uh, we also had a uh, what I would argue was a gift handed to us from the flight environment. We had the um, uh, flight control module number one uh, had a reset, uh, and and uh, that was due to a radiation hit. And it did exactly what it was designed to do. And uh, we have a feature called the cross channel reset, and uh, the system uh, recovered uh, by itself. And uh, and it handled the uh, the radiation hit uh, as it was designed. So we're we're again characterizing the system performance. We're learning from it. We're learning what what the uh, uh, what the hardware is telling us. Uh, some of this is unfamiliar to us uh, in the flight environment, and uh, and and we're rolling that into into all the operations. So I don't know, uh, Rick, if you have anything to add to that. No, you've covered it well. Uh, that cross that cross channel restart essentially is when it when a when a computer goes down and comes back up it, ga it gathers information from the other computers to to basically get right back to where it was and get back into a, a sync with all the uh, other three computers yep. work just as it's designed and I'll answer the last question or the second question 
Uh, so we've got, uh, we're returning the Orion IMUs, or inertial measuring units, uh, the GPSRs, which is the receivers for GPS, and then the phase array antennas. So the, that's the list of items that uh, we are using from Artemis 1 and putting on board Artemis 2. All right, thank you all. The next question comes from Issam Ahmed. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, for Mike Sarpin, um, will we see the Apollo landing sites on the next lunar flyby and uh, which ones? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Hassan. Uh, Rick's probably uh, better in tune with that one, but as I understand it, we will get to see multiple Apollo landing sites. Uh, yeah, Rick, we, if... we, we do believe there's a team that's actually actively config, you know, plan, making the plan, putting the plan together to support the imagery as we fly by the moon. Um, uh, the, the positive is on, on, on the return power flyby, uh, that area will be lit, so we have the opportunity. We just got to get the vehicle in the right uh, orientation and, and get the cameras going. We're going to be taking imagery, so uh, and I don't know exactly which sites, but I know on the uh, on the outbound power flyby there was four sites uh, that were all in the dark, so we didn't capture them. But uh, I, my expectation is the same four will be will be uh, will be available this time with the, the proper lighting conditions. We're looking forward to it. Up next on the phone, we have Tim Fernholtz. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for taking this question. Um, two things I was wondering. One, can you talk a little bit more about the two flight rule waivers you need to do for the additional objectives and, and what that looks like? And then second, now just thinking about the deep space network, um, now that you're using it with Artemis and sort of breaking in those procedures, uh, are there thoughts about what might be necessary to improve or invest in or add to the DSN system ahead of crewed flight with Artemis? Thank you. Yeah, Tim, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I'll talk about the, the uh, flight roll waivers here up front. Um, but in terms of the uh, accomplishing uh, what we're calling characterizing the thermal envelope. Orion is, um, by design, it wants to fly tail the sun. Uh, that is for um, thermal stability of the vehicle, but also from a power production standpoint. And the uh, vehicle, uh, through analysis, is allowed to go up to 20 degrees in, the, in either pitch or yaw out of that um, perfect tail to sun orientation. So what we're doing is we're, we're characterizing the corners of the box, you know, 20 degrees, 20 degrees, and, and doing that. And there's also a, a thermal recovery time required, uh, as, as Rick had mentioned earlier, about um, if we're out of attitude uh, greater than that 20 degrees for more than three hours, we have to do a 10-hour tail-to-sun thermal recovery period before we're allowed to use the uh, uh, orbital maneuvering system. So. The waiver was specific to um, the uh, thermal analysis requirements and, and the desire to gather some, some of the uh, data on that, um, on that thermal um, uh, envelope expansion, and, and that is um, consistent with a, with a test flight. We want to, we want to do envelope expansion and, and validate our models. Um, I don't know, uh, Rick, uh, if, you, if you have anything to add on the, on the flight rule waivers. Uh, no, you covered it. Okay. Uh, well, that was for the first one. I think the second one, you're going to cover that one? Um, I'm trying to remember. It's, uh, the, the second the one was solar, for the, the solar, solar positioning, positioning constraints, yes. right. We, uh, for, our, for, our, um, for the various burns that we, uh, we do with Orion, we have specific attitudes or positioning that we put the, the solar array wings, and that's to uh, prevent damage from plume impingement from the, the reaction control thrusters. Um, and for this 100-second plus X test, we want to put, the, we want to put the, the position of the arrays different than what had been previously analyzed and was considered approved, um, and that's, that's why we're waiving. And this is to gain the data that we want. Uh, that's specifically why we're doing the, the test. Um, so that's the, the rationale for that, for that waiver. Yeah, and, and thank you for the reminder. So that the, um, the specific uh, constraint that, that we're trying to avoid is not a, a plume impingement or a load constraint on the, on the solar array wing. It has to do with the radiant heating from the engine that's in proximity to the, to the solar array wing. Um, so uh, those were the, uh, the two um, 
waivers that, that were approved and they are specific to these test conditions and specific to the objectives that were set up. Um, these are not um, just what I'll call generic waivers for, for operations uh, across the mission and, and we did make that clear today. Um, hey Mike, would you mind, I'll, I'll jump in with a fine, couple fine points yeah. relative to that. From a spacecraft perspective, Mike talks about the 2020-20 degree envelope. I mean, we, we've already analyzed this as, as pre-mission. We know that we can operate in these regimes. There were some flight rule constraints relative to the P, two pieces, the OMZ or the, uh, the main engine, and then also the star tracker was also. So I think from an overall risk perspective, that's why we talked about, you know, accomplish, or pressing forward with this particular objective is because we've, we've already we feel like through our pre-mission analysis that, that we're able to operate in those boundaries. We just want to make sure in this real flight environment that we the boxes. So that's one piece. And that's the same for the arrays. The arrays, we've tested and certified them to, to be in these configurations, although we didn't nominally want to operate them in, in that because of what we needed to do for the mission. But now as we do the flight test objectives, there's, there's uh, no risk with the hardware uh, in terms of where we want to park these arrays for this test. So I just want yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Howard. Mm -hmm. And then, Tim, you had a second part to your question. I, I'm forgetting the second part. Uh, no worries. Thank you for the detailed explanation. Uh, I was just asking about, given uh, sort of the work through of the process with the Deep Space Network, is there any thought to investing in, you know, further capabilities or improving that network ahead of crewed flight when it may be more important to, to get that communications done quickly? Yes, Tim. Uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, we uh, are very mindful that the Deep Space Network um, has many customers, and Artemis is one of those. Um, but there are many science missions out there. There are many uh, space technology missions and, and other partnership missions out there. Uh, so as we expand the portfolio of Artemis capabilities, whether it's Gateway or the Human Landing System, um, and uh, some of the surface uh, operations for the manifest, uh, we, are, we are acutely aware that we need to improve the uh, communications and tracking and navigation assets out there. Uh, so we do have additional investments planned in the, uh, in the deep space network. I don't want to get ahead of that um, because there's probably a procurement that's, that's in play ahead of us on that. Okay, next question is from Kristen Fisher with CNN. everyone. This question is for Senator Nelson, if he's still on. If not, um, I, I guess, Mike, it might be for you. But uh, given the fact that this uh, mission, Artemis 1, is going so well, wondering if we could get an update on when a crew may be announced for Artemis 2. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Kristen. Thank you for the question. Um, we've purposefully um, deferred that decision until after Artemis 1 is successfully complete. We want to we want to get through a demonstration of our uh, human transportation system before uh, we um, name a crew um, for a number of reasons. One is uh, just time between missions. We need to understand the time uh, between Artemis 1 and 2. Uh, it is it is uh, possible to be in training too long. And, and we, we need to find the sweet spot relative to the, uh, the training time for the crew. Um, but once a crew is named, um, they're, they're going to be um, highly sought after people. And there are other uh, responsibilities for uh, astronauts in the astronaut office. And we need to keep that in mind as well from a uh, workload and, um, and just kind of an overall um, uh, flight crew availability standpoint. And uh, their time is precious, so uh, we've purposely deferred that until after Artemis 1. I don't have a specific date for you, but um, it will be after the mission. Thank you. And our next question is from Jem Siegel. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for taking my uh, question today. Um, what will be the uh, approximate length of the Artemis 2 mission? And secondly, roughly how many NASA and partner people are involved in, in monitoring uh, Artemis 1? Thank you. Okay. I'll take the mission length, Rick, and you want to take the team? And Howard, do you want to talk about the size of your teams? Um, so, uh, Jim, um, in terms of the mission length for Artemis 2, we're looking at a 10 and a half day uh, crewed flight test. So four astronauts will fly a uh, one day highly elliptical orbit uh, to uh, 
basically shake down the life support system and perform a proximity operations demonstration with the uh, upper stage um, before it is uh, separated uh, at, a, at a far distance from Orion. And then at the end of that one day, um, high Earth orbit, Orion will essentially perform a mission completion maneuver uh, and use the service module to uh, perform the uh, translunar injection maneuver and put itself on a free return trajectory about um, about uh, four and a half days out and about four and a half days back. So uh, it'll be a little over 10 days, and um, that is, that's our Artemis II plan. So Rick, do you want to talk about um, your team, and Howard, do you want to talk about your teams as well? Sure. Um, so uh, it's a little hard, but um, in the front room, we have 10 um, Ten flight controllers, and then for each one of those, they have either one. Some have up to two or uh, two uh, support personnel in the, in the multi-purpose support room, and then we have three shifts. So there, you're looking at on the uh, for the flight control team specific, we're looking at on the order of 60. Um, that doesn't include, uh, you know, the ground controller who, who has uh, responsibilities for making sure the facilities are configured properly. There's, uh, there's quite a few of those uh, people, and I, I couldn't give you a number, but I'm guessing probably another f uh, five, so 15, so we're looking around 75 people inside MCC. It's, it's, it's a pretty close number. And then uh, let Howard talk to the mission evaluation room. Yeah, that's a good question, but a tough question. I think uh, same with uh, Rick. You know, uh, I, I I would estimate maybe ten consoles uh, in the in the mission uh, evaluation room, uh, which is the support from engineering perspective. You know, probably a couple people on console per three shifts uh, across the a day, and so you're looking at maybe 60 people. And then we've got some support from Europe as well. They've got uh, some people supporting from an engineering perspective. They, we've also got people at the Lockheed Martin facility in Denver. Uh, so probably, you know, somewhere in that 70 to 100, you know, so, somewhere around there, depending on the day and the burn, we probably bring more uh, engineering support as needed for the bigger burns. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as, as we have issues, we'll bring more people to, to look at these issues and try to resolve them quickly. Uh, so it varies uh, depending on the day. Um, but, uh, you know, somewhere around there, probably similar to what Rick's got uh, across the board. Yeah, and, and then, Jim, from the mission management team standpoint, for day of launch, because we have the propulsive elements associated with the space launch system, we had 24 mission management team members. Uh, we've collapsed that down since then to about 14 because the rocket has largely done its job, but we do include the uh, the uh, space launch system program management team in that. And then on day of launch, the um, um, SLS Engineering Support Center out of Huntsville, which is their technical reach back, uh, had roughly 110 people supporting, and that team has, has largely been sunset since we've gotten through the point of translunar injection. Okay, we have time for just a couple of more questions. Uh, this one is from Elisha Sowers. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, this also would have been for Administrator Nelson. I know Kristen uh, sort of asked uh, along the same lines of what I'm going to ask, but at, at the top of the call, Mr. Nelson had said that the astronaut, astronauts in the Artemis III lander will be, quote, the first woman and the next man, end quote, on the moon. And uh, I may be way over analyzing this, but is that slight departure in his phrasing significant? Because before now, it seems possible that there could be two women astronauts landing on the moon. And I'm just wondering if he misspoke, or is that comment an indication that decisions have been made? Because um, I know you said that the crew hasn't been announced publicly yet, but um, have they been decided already internally? Yeah. Elisha, thank you for the question. I'm not going to get ahead of that one. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what the, what the decision is and, and uh, who is on that crew. Okay, and our last question for this afternoon is from Robert Perlman. Hi, thanks. Um, a, uh, a question and a, and a quick follow-up to a previous question, I think both for Rick. Um, there was mention recently in, in NASA's update about Callisto being fired up, and uh, we saw a video of, um, I guess, the disco or party mode. But I was wondering from a mission control perspective, as you've seen it being used, how effective of a tool is it to have the ability to query an AI aboard an uncrewed spacecraft um, looking ahead to the day that maybe all four Orion astronauts go down to the surface, not just two? And then just as a quick update, when you were mentioning the Apollo sites 
Can you just clarify in terms of the resolution that the public should expect that are you going to be able to resolve features at the landing sites or you're just photographing Tranquility Base or Frau Mora um, and it's just a general area? Thanks. Sure. Uh, with respect to the CIT, the crew interface technology payload, um, I personally think it will be very advantageous uh, for the crews, probably more so when we actually leave Gateway and start going deeper into into the, into space, um, where the time delay between us and and uh, the ground and the and the and the crew uh, that it's, it's going to be problematic for us to be able to do things real time. And if they have uh, a device on board that has can answer a lot of their questions uh, based on a database that they have, uh, that seems like something that would be beneficial to the crew. As far as um, you know, uh, the way it's set up for Artemis One, the flight control team really we just we're just activating the equipment and scheduling the services at the deep space network. We we got a special schedule a specific uh, antenna, and then uh, make sure it's configured properly to support the the event. Um, but as far as uh, of all the other stuff that's going on, we're just kind of enjoying the the, the imagery just like you guys are, um, but not really actively participating. I know how. Howard probably can give you a little bit of insight because he's participating in a couple of the events, uh, so he can give you his perspective. Um, I'll pause a second and see if you want to add anything there. Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, you know, part of uh, this is a demonstration of the technology uh, and really operating in the environment uh, of uh, where we want to be in terms of lunar orbit. And so I think we're getting really good, um, I guess, results. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's been a good collection of data so far. And uh, the engagement has, I think, gone very well. And appreciate uh, Rick and, and the flight control team helping make that possible. Uh, I think it takes some effort to do the scheduling and, and coordination. And uh, I think everybody that's participated in it uh, has, has seen the, the, the value, as Rick has, has uh, alluded to. And I think we'll, as time will tell, in terms of what is needed, I think you know the, the demands of what the crew requires to support and, and uh, operate the spacecraft and not, uh, execute the mission will determine uh, the capabilities we need. And, and I think these are all good things that we're planting the seeds for and uh, allowing us to uh, reap those when it's time. And as far as your second question, uh, as far as what the expectations are for the quality of the imagery of, of the lunar or the Apollo sites as we fly by, uh, there's a team working it. I, 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 so I don't really have a good answer for you, but I will tell you that just the the, the imagery that you saw of the moon surface as we went by, um, you know, some of that was from from our. Um, optical nav navigation camera. You know, we use the solar array wings that have the, the, the cameras at the end. Um, we're not really going to be tracking specific ground sites as we fly over that. That's, that's would be asking a bit, and you run the risk of, of not getting anything if you, if you try to over-engineer it. Um, so it'll be comparable to what you saw uh, as we went by um, for the outbound power flyby. So I, I, I apologize, but I can't give you better, better information than that. All right. Thank you all who tuned in and asked questions. And thank you also to our briefers today, as well as Administrator Nelson and uh, NASA Center Director Vanessa White here at the Johnson Space Center. A quick look ahead at some things we have coming up. We have the distant retrograde departure burn uh, coming up this Thursday, December 1st. But ahead of that, we're going to preview with another briefing on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Central Time. Don't forget, you can also watch live views from Orion almost any time that we have signal from the spacecraft at go.nasa.gov slash Artemis Live. Some amazing views uh, that we've had so far today, so make sure to tune in and see those. You can also read our daily blog updates at nasa.gov or at blogs.nasa.gov slash Artemis. And of course, don't forget, you can see the latest imagery and videos on our Flickr account at Flickr.com slash photos slash NASA to explore. That'll wrap it up for us here today at Mission or at Johnson Space Center. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you again soon.